Okay, so let, let's now try to investigate what happens to this kind of structural non-separability when we try to, to make polarimetry on those vector beams, those vector vortices, okay? Like the, the, the bell modes that I mentioned, okay? So, uh, as I said, a fully polarized beam would have the, the summation of the Stokes parameter, squared Stokes parameter is equal to one, partially polarized, something that is smaller than one, and fully unpolarized, it gets to zero. What happens if I send a vector beam like this to polarimetric measurements? So I take the vector beam, I send it to a polarizer, I rotate the polarizer, I use other kinds of polarizer for our circular and so on, and I measure with a bucket detector, big detector, that swallow the whole beam, okay? Then what happens, what describes the results are these. You take your vector structure, which is the vector beam right here. You take the inner product, the polarization part, with the, the, the basis element that you are projecting on, okay? And what you get, you, you, you add up uh, for all transverse modes that you have, if you do, and then what you find, you can do this theoretically, yeah? you can just compute this, this here, you find that this polarimetric measurement of a vector beam gives zero. So if you try to characterize the polarization of a vector beam with the standard uh, tomographic procedure, you will find zero. You will, say, you will think that this is unpolarized beam, like the one that comes from the lamp, even if it's an intense laser with a huge coherent, coherence left. So what's missing? What's missing? How, how can we talk about this non-polarizability in something that we know that is, is polarized in a very special way? So this is, a, this is something that we need quantum information to talk about. We need it. So actually, if we try to do the same, I do now I can compute the orbital, the orbital uh, Stokes parameter, and then what do I find if I take a vector beam? They also give zero. It says that you don't have any, any spatial structure on your beam. Okay? So in both cases, zero and zero. So what happens is, and then we need to proceed with the analogy with quantum mechanics. Okay? So suppose you have a two qubit system, A and B, and they are maximally entangled. And now, what we are doing there is equivalent to measuring only one of the, of the qubits. So they are maximally entangled, and I'm making, trying to do tomography here, only here. So I know that my tomographic results will be governed by the partial trace of the density matrix. So I take the full density matrix of the combined system, I take the, the partial trace, and then I have the single qubit state. And if maximally entangled, when I do this, what is left is a complete statistical mixture. Okay? So, and this is, even if the, the thing is globally coherent, fully coherent, it will be locally incoherent. It looks like locally incoherent. Okay? So, this is the only way we have to understand what is going on with our, with our vector beams when we try to make just a naive polarization uh, tomography with bucket detectors. So this is very important. I was talking about the, with big detectors that swallow the whole beam. If we want, uh, we can now go back and see that actually what I'm measuring here, so I, I have to project this, uh, the, the input, the incoming structure on the, uh, on the basis vector 
that uh, I'm, our, my setup is uh, prepared to, to measure. And I integrate all area of the detector. Now, what is interesting is that you can, since the, the, the transverse mode structure, the transverse modes that I showed you, they are a complete set, they form a complete set, then I can turn this integral in the form of a summation that looks exactly as the partial trace in quantum mechanics. So, homework, homework. Show this equality here. Okay, take a picture and show this equality here. Homework for you. So, and then you'll see that this gives you the parameter, the, stoke, the, the, the polarization, the uh, zero. Okay, the, the summation of square parameter looks will be equal to zero. Now, the same holds true for the, for the spatial part. Hmm? You can put in this, in this way, and what you see is that actually the measurement that you do is involves a summation, a summation over the polarization states. And this is the partial trace here. The partial trace is right here. And that's where you lose coherence. Okay? That's where you lose coherence. Now, let's see something else that happens in analogy with, the, with, the, uh, with this uh, quantum and classical analogy, uh, which is, suppose that you have, again, a pair of qubits. They are, for example, in a maximally entangled state. And you do the following. You take one of the qubits, you do a measurement. You make some projection in some arbitrary state, phi. Then the, the whole structure, the whole state, will immediately collapse to a factorized form in which the state that is left on the other side will depend, since they were maximally entangled, will depend on the kind of measurement that, on the kind of the projection that you made on the B side. Okay? It's just quantum, basic quantum mechanics. Huh? And we can even uh, derive what, what is the, if this is, for example, is the, the, the combined, the initial combined state, then we know which state is left on the other part, taking these inner products here, and so this gives the coefficients of the superposition between 0 and 1 that is left on the, on the side of qubit A. Huh? And uh, the, in, the ge in general case, what you do is just, again, you project one side, take the, the, the whole density matrix, take the, the partial trace, this is what is left on the side of qubit A, while qubit B was projected, bang, to phi B, okay? What we do here, for example, if I want to recover the coherence properties that is in this vector beam, I must select spatially. So now, instead of using a bucket, instead of leaving the detect, uh, all the intensity reach the detector, I start to make the, uh, the polarimetry of small spatial parts of the beams, of the beam. And then as I reduce the size, the effective detection size, the degree of polarization will increase from zero to the bucket detector, to the big one, until it tends to one, okay? It tends to one as this, the area, the surface of the detection surface tends to zero, okay? So you gain information on one degree of freedom. You are gaining information on the spatial part, and then you are recovering the coherence that you have on the other part. So the same, the same holds true for the, for the, the orbital part. Hmm. Uh, another, interesting, another interesting property of these uh, combined uh, spin orbital structures is rotational, uh, rotational, rotation invariance. Okay? They are rotationally invariant. And on the next lecture, 
I will show how we use this to implement quantum cryptography, okay, with alignment, alignment-free quantum cryptography. So, take for example a two-qubit state, such as the, the, the one of the, this Bell state psi plus zero zero plus one one over square root of two. What is quite interesting, take general rotated qubit states like this, theta and theta prime. Okay, they, they, those are just 0 and 1 rotated by the angle theta. Okay, these linear transformations here. What is quite interesting is that this kind of correlation, it remains the same. So it, it, this says that, okay, if the, the polarization is, if the qubit 1 is at 0, then the qubit 2 is at 0. But also, if qubit 1 is at theta, at the state theta, Qubit 2 will be also in state theta, theta or theta prime, theta prime. So they are always, in any orientation, they are always parallel to each other. This, both this, or both this. It doesn't matter if it's just 0 and 1 or any rotated basis. This will be the same. So this also holds true for the vector beams. And, but this is visually evident. Because after all, we see that this figure here is rotational. We see this visually. Okay, if I rotate this this structure here, I see no change. Okay, I see no change at all. So it's expected. To, so if I take, for example, this vector beam and, and write it down in terms of rotated linear basis, so this would be a Hermit Gaussian rotated by theta, and this would be a linear polarization rotated by theta, also. So this happens that. If I try to project, I take a vector beam and I project, uh, I pass it through an arbitrary linear polarizer. I take a linear polarizer and orient it arbitrarily. So the transmitted mode must be a Hermit Gaussian mode that is oriented with the polarizer. Well, this is the idea. Oh, okay, there you go. So this is the idea. We have the vector beam here. Here is a, camera, a CCD camera. I have a polarizer, linear polarizer, and I'll just rotate the polarizer. And there you go. This is the experimental result. Okay? As you rotate the polarizer in front of the, the vector beam, what you get is a rotating emit Gaussian mode that is oriented at the same, on the same direction as the polarizer. Okay. We can use this, for example, so there is, again, okay, we go with. Okay, so, now, the interesting thing is that, for example, suppose that you, you have this, now this basis which is a bit different. It has the same uh, rotation coefficients, but now I put an I factor here. Okay? I have an I factor here, so this is theta plus, theta minus. And then this, this combines, this combines, so this is a, let's say, a rotate, complex rotated uh, basis and the former one was just a, a normal rotation. So now suppose that I take the two qubits. On the first qubit, I will do the the normal rotation without the i factor. And the second qubit, I use the basis with the i factor. So the Bell state, this kind of Bell state here, it it has this property. It's either theta, theta plus, or theta prime, theta minus. It doesn't depend on the variable theta. I can vary theta at will. Okay? So this all is true for the vector modes and what is quite interesting is that if I have theta oriented at 45 degrees, I can generate a helical waveform on the beam. So I can, I can use it to transfer orbital angular momentum okay, by, me, by, taking, by making polarization projections, okay? So this is, let's see how it works. So this, the idea is the following. I have here 
the vector, uh, the vector beam, a quarter wave plate, a quarter wave plate in a linearly polarized beam at 45 degrees would generate circular polarization and, the, and then transfer spin, uh, spin angular momentum. Uh, uh, but then I will do this. I will put the uh, quarter wave plate and follow the quarter wave plate with a polarizer. And I will rotate the polarizer. So at this case, that's what you get. So we start with the Hamid Gaussian mode, and then it gets orbital angular momentum. It goes through a Lagrange mode, and then it will acquire orbital angular momentum in the opposite sense, and then go back to the uh, Hamid input Hamid Gaussian, the initial Hamid Gaussian mode. Okay, so I can use this kind. I'm doing polarization projection, and I'm creating orbital angular. Momentum. Okay, so I'm, I'm making measurements on one qubit and I'm producing the, the state I want on the second one, thanks to, the, to this non-separability, okay, the structural non-separability. No, again. So, I think that uh, I said enough for today. So, this was the main idea for this first lecture, okay. Um, I wanted to present you the fundamentals of optical orbital angular momentum of a light beam, okay? present you the transverse modes, show you that actually this, the transverse structure of a laser beam, a well collimated la laser beam, it offers itself as a, uh, a physical platform to encode quantum information, to encode information, okay? and to coherent operate it. Uh, uh, I, I could also combine this degree of freedom that I, I, I introduced here, that I presented you, uh, with the polarization, which is more uh, popularly uh, known, okay, with the polarization states, and then find what would be uh, the, uh, the analogous of a quantum entanglement state quantum entangled state, okay? So, and see that when I combine the orbital part and the spin part, I, I produce a tensor product structure, vector space of modes. I haven't quantized, there are no operators, no operators here, okay? No uncertainty, no uncertainty <laughs> relations. Uh, but I have the, the tensor product structure and I can identify in this tensor product vector space I can identify modes that cannot be factorized. So uh, this is true for classical laser beams. And uh, the interesting stuff here is that, for example, as I said before, the, for the problem of polarimetry of one of those vector beams, radially polarized beam for polarimetry, how to interpret the, res the, the, the fact that you try to make polarimetry in a vector beam and you find zero. You find the, the Stokes parameters of a non-polarized non light. In order to understand this, you need to bring quantum information into the problem, quantum information uh, uh, notions into the problem. Huh? And you, you, you just be, it's, it's like beer, just don't abuse. Okay, so it's, you can have fun, but just don't abuse. You have to know where to stop, where to, you have to know where to make the true difference, okay? So the main point is in the quantum uh, classical border, and we will talk about that in, in the next lecture, is when we go to non-locality. There's no non-locality here. We are talking about independent degrees of freedom of the same object. Okay, of the same object. It's very important to make a clear cut between what is not reachable with this kind of non-separability. It's very important. Okay? Um, so, but what is quite funny and what, what surprised us a lot was that we could find a role for Bell inequality in this context. Not in the sense, not to prove uh, non-locality or 
or whatever, but to show that you can build an inequality that is formally equivalent to Bell inequality and to make an interpretation of this fact, of a violation of this inequality, in terms of the structure, spatial vector structure of the beam. Okay? And this is what we are going to discuss on next lecture. So thank you very much. So I'd, I'd like to offer a, a, um, a thought that I've, I'll run it by you. It was because it's really interesting that it, what, what you addressed about it's not quantum, yet you can write about inequality and people get confused. But I think what you said, if there's no states, and as you say, there's no operators, there's no commutation, therefore there's no noise. No noise. In a measurement, right? I think that's, yeah. the, that's the key point. And yeah. in fact, it's beautifully, you said it very well in your vector beam, your vector beam that has all this polarization going all different ways is actually very well defined mm -hmm. as, as a field. But a if, you, if you measure the polarization, you, you get something that looks like a, it's a beautiful analogy with the statistical mixture, mm -hmm. maximum statistical mixture that, mm -hmm. that is an entangled state. But in fact, that is not... Uh, when we have a real statistical quantum statistical mixture, it's noisy as hell. If you measure half of it, right, half of the, it, it, and it's irredeemably noisy. There's no way we can, whereas here, the, the classical property is actually very complex, mm -hmm. but well defined. So the absence of noise, I think, is, is, the, is, the, is the key point. But yeah. it's beautiful that the math is all lined up so well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I thought I was understanding everything up to the very end when you said that there is no uncertainty relations there, and then I got confused. But uh, so if I have a very well-defined state, like an emission Gauss well-defined state, then in the other basis it's not well-defined. So if I kind of try to measure these things, I mean one will be well, very well-defined and the other will not. So yeah. So the, the, this is a key difference. Uh, with respect to quantum mechanics is exactly at the measurement. So is, quantum mechanics is, is a combination of the superposition principle, but we, we have also the collapse. So when we measure something, you cannot get half zero or half one. So the, the fact that in, in class, in this case, if I take a Hermit Gaussian mode or a Laguerre Gaussian mode, and I make a measurement, so a, a projection on the Hermit Gaussian basis, I am allowed to have half the intensity to one port, half the intensity to the other port. I am allowed to have. That's where the classicality comes in. If, if I were in the single photon regime, then this would be like BS, beam splitters. Click there or click here, not both. Since the students are shy, we will continue. And uh, I have... Can you come back to the first video? And I was considering, you probably know something to tell us, if people use it, or this idea for metrology, because you are... For metrology. metrology. Well, this is something that I have a challenge. Uh, we, we have a specialist in metrology in our lab now, which is Gabriel Bieb. Yeah, could you just raise that? Yeah. We have already discussed about that. We are trying to somehow uh, bring these ideas in, into the context of uh, weak measurements, but we, we haven't found so far any, any uh, good prospect for this. Yeah, we have uh, uh, recently discovered, I mean based on a few papers, that uh, these uh, Hermit Gauss, Gaussian modes are very useful for uh, if, you, if you want to implement, uh, want a metrology process to estimate uh, for instance, um, uh, a small shift on your bin, on your, so you can you can use this this basis for implementing. As I was even considering higher order things, and people have done, I'm sure. If not, we should do. This is the point. <laughs> but anyone else? 
<laughs> well, uh, from the classical point of view, because this is strictly relied, they can use Laguerre Gauss modes on optical tweezers, for instance, to rotate small particles. And if you include this polarization dependency, do you have any applications? Do you know? Yeah, actually, these radially polarized beams, they are very well known by accelerator people. Because when you, if you, if you see, for example, take the, the, the azimuthally, or the, when you take the, the radially polarized beam, okay, for example, it's radially polarized, the electric field. The magnetic field is azimuthally polarized. Then it circulates around the beam. Then you just apply Faraday law or Maxwell equation, and you see that you must have a strong longitudinal beam. So this is something that we have to be very careful about paraxial optics, is that the beam can, it's, cannot be the electric field the electromagnetic field in this case cannot be strictly seen as transverse wave. So it has some longitudinal and it's, it's used to accelerate particles. Okay, I have to say in the first lecture, students very good. In the second lectures, <laughs> just <laughs> professional guys. <laughs> but thank you very much. Sure, That's wonderful. Right. <laughs>